Good evening and welcome everyone to this very special live event in conversations uh, brought to you by the River Country Campaign at Friends of the Earth. My name is Megan Williams and I'm the coordinator of the River Country Campaign and I'm really pleased to be bringing you this discussion uh, tonight about the origins of the Basin Plan and the politics driving um, the Basin as a whole. And I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I'm coming to you from the Boon Wurrung country in the Northern Nations. Riding, um, the and basin as a whole. And I would like to start by, and I'm just gonna apologize for that. And I'm just gonna continue. Sorry about that, everyone. So I, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. I'm coming to you from Boonwurrung country in the Kulin Nations. And the Murray-Darling Basin is and how we're going to start off. And I'm just going to apologise for that. Are we getting feedback again? Yes. Yeah. So that first one I think was me because I have my Facebook browser open. Um, if anyone watching in Zoom, uh, can you close your Facebook browser? Um, and we'll give it one more try, third time lucky. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. I'm coming to you from Boon country uh, and there are over 40 Indigenous nations in the Murray-Darling Basin. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging from across these great lands and acknowledge that First Nations knowledge is deeply connected to country and First Nations people are on the front line feeling the impacts of water policy. And so for everyone at home, I'm really keen to find out uh, where you're joining us from. So if you want to in the comments, uh, acknowledge the country that you're joining us from, tell us where you are, and also tell us why you're joining tonight and what you'd like to get out of this session. So today we're going to be talking with Margaret Simons. Hi, Margaret. Hello. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, who is an award-winning freelance journalist and an author of 13 books and numerous articles, including her new release, Crimea River, The Tragedy of the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, we will be chatting about the book and the lessons that have been learned through writing it. And also joining us is Mel Gray. How are you going there, Mel? Yeah, hi, Megan. I'm good, thanks. Thanks for organising all this. No, oh, it's uh, my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. So Mel is a community uh, member and Healthy River Ambassador and also the founder of the Healthy Rivers Dubbo. Uh, and this is a live and interactive session. So we're going to start by chatting with Margaret about her book. Um, and as your questions come up, please pop them in the comments. We will try to get to as many of them as we can. And we want this to be um, as open and interactive as we can. So give us your feedback, give us your comments, and we'll try to get to everything that we can. Uh, and after that, Mel is going to give us a rundown about the issues uh, as she sees them, where she sits on the Macquarie River, uh, and what it's like living out there in Dubbo and being really heavily engaged in water policy. So to start us off, Margaret, uh, what you've written is a brilliant account of the history and the events and the politics that led to the creation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Um, what inspired you to take on this project and can you run us through um, the journey that you went on? Sure, yes. Well, in terms of what inspired me to do it, I feel in some ways I've been writing about the Murray um, all my life. Um, I was raised in South Australia and had most of my holidays and weekends as a girl in Wakery in the Riverland of South Australia. My first job as a journalist was on the local paper in Wakery. Um, sadly, the River News, it's, uh, it's just closed, sadly, as one of the victims of COVID. Mm. Um, and my first novel was set in Wakery or a town that was based on Wakery. And then I, because I observed the impact of uh, problems with water as a teenager and saw the changes to irrigation practice as I was growing up, I was always interested and, of course, loved that country. 
Um, one of my books uh, previously is The Meeting of the Waters, which was about the High Marsh Island dispute, which was all about the mouth of the Murray and the dispute over Indigenous and white fella narratives of land at that point. But I, and I've written other essays about the Murray Darling as well, but not for about 10 years. And the last thing I wrote before this, about 10 to 12 years ago, was pretty optimistic about the Murray Darling Basin Plan, which was then being devised. And I was aware that things seemed to be going wrong, but I wasn't really very clear why. It had clearly become incredibly complicated and difficult to find that out. There were lots of headlines about the Murray-Darling Basin, but I didn't really feel I understood where it all fitted into the big picture. So I decided to try and find out. And one of the great luxuries of being a freelance journalist is if you can persuade somebody to commission you, you can basically do whatever you like. <laughs> Um, so I got the commission from the quarterly essay and I do hope people who are listening to this consider subscribing and I'm just going to um, share my screen with you so I can show you where I went I hope everybody can see that so I took um, four trips I think it was altogether. one I drove from Sydney to Dubbo um, and then went north from Dubbo up into to see the Macquarie Marshes um, went around cotton country around Warren and then drove from there down to the Lachlan River and Forbes uh, along to Lake Cargelico and Hilston down through Griffith and Leeton and Hay and then home via through Victoria stopping in Deniloquin and Tokenwall where I interviewed Chris Brooks who's mentioned in the book and came home through Victoria. The other trip I took was from South Australia, um, started in Adelaide, drove all the way to Renmark, doing interviews all along the way, of course, and then followed the river all the way down to the mouth and Hindmarsh Island, where, of course, I've been before. And then the biggest trip, I started in Mildura and followed the Darling all the way up into where it branches out into all these incredible rivers. Um, and went right up into the heart of cotton country around St George and uh, Dirranbandi before driving into Brisbane through the Darling Downs. So an awful lot of driving, basically. Um, it's a very big what basin. What time frame did you do all those trips? Uh, well, each trip would have been about 10 days. The, the last one following the Darling would have been more than that, probably close on three weeks. But the other two would have been, or well, the South Australian one was probably three or four days. The other one would have been about a 10 day trip. Um, but yes, as it turns out, of course, the last travel I'm likely to be doing for a while. <laughs> Yes, yes, we're yes. all facing the COVID-19, um, the perils of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So, um, like you mentioned, that big trip through the Darling, that's also where your story begins. Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, what, what did you learn travelling up the river and hearing people's stories? Like, what was the most overwhelming thing that you were confronted with? Well, it's... Um largely a sad story not exclusively a sad story because you almost have to keep reminding yourself that it is a small miracle that we actually have a Murray Darling Basin plan many countries which are trying to share a scarce resource of water don't have a plan which at least at least in theory means that allocation of that resource can be worked out and decided now, there's a lot of things going wrong with the plan. I think there's some things wrong with its design and there's certainly a lot wrong with how it's being implemented. But we do have it, which means, and there isn't really another game um, in town for sorting it out. So we have to try and make this one work. But the realities of how it's not working combined with the awfulness of the drought, now thankfully broken in some of the areas of the basin, is terrible. I described the Lower Darling um, as one of the saddest places in Australia. That's the area around Pankari and Menindi, where, of course, they had the fish kill a couple of years ago. Um, and there is literally, or when I was there, there was no water there at all. Um, and the impact of that on the irrigators, on the traditional owners in Wilcannia, um, was devastating, really, and to see the landscape in such poor condition. And while the Darling has always been um, a boom and bust river. You know, there's Henry Lawson poems talking about how it's dying, going back that far. Um, but the truth is that increasingly frequently, uh, the Darling doesn't flow, doesn't meet the Murray. Um, and certainly the New South Wales government, the way that it's managing issues at the moment, 
the, the reality seems to be that they're giving up on the river um, downstream from uh, Burke, really, that they're just allowing the irrigators and the people who live along that river to put up with the river not flowing, except when there's heaps of water, because when there's heaps of water, everybody's happy. Mm. And you do kind of allude to the, like, the design of the basin plan having winners and losers. Do you think it was accepted from the start that the Lower Darling was going to be sacrificed? No, I don't think it was at all. Um, so the plan so how, how did it get to that point. So the plan is macro policy. It um, it decides how much water has to be effectively clawed back from irrigation, but how you actually bring about those savings is largely up to the states. And at, at the sort of micro level, it's down to things called water resource plans or water sharing plans. The names vary a bit from area to area, um, which decide how the water will be shared between towns, irrigators, the environment, um, from catchment to catchment or area of catchment to catchment. Um, and the way in which the Lower Darling have, has been retired has been New South Wales wants to achieve a lot of its savings by eliminating evaporation from the Menindee Lakes, uh, which are huge basins, um, which are very shallow, and they're used as water storages, but because they're shallow and vast and in a very hot environment, an awful lot of water is lost through evaporation. So the New South Wales government and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority want to drain them more frequently, save the water from evaporation, and therefore not have to get that water back from irrigators. But it means, of course, that the reliability of the water supply downstream from the Menindee Lakes is enormously reduced. Added to that, um, the water resource plan um, for the cotton growers around and north of upstream from Burke, um, it's very complicated, but in, broadly speaking, there was a fix that went in just before the plan was adopted. And it means that the irrigators can pump when the river is lower than they theoretically should be and there's not much doubt that that is one of the reasons why the darling is running less often there's also increasing amounts of water being stored in private dams further to the north and we actually don't know how much is in those private dams um, and the state governments both new south wales and queensland are really only just getting to grips with regulating that now mm. and you go in depth into some of the factors that have major influence over decisions, you know, election cycles, and you talk about, you know, kind of Howard's role in setting up the Water Act and then um, the influence of Tony Windsor over the Gillard government. Um, like, can you talk a bit more about the, the power dynamics between states and politics that mm. have... Um, made the administration of the basin plan so questionable? Yeah, well, it's it's a difficult thing to do because um, the disputes go back to before Federation when the founding fathers were wrangling over the constitution. Some of the most bitterly argued over issues were to do with water and in some ways things never change. People threaten to tear documents up and to walk out and so on. And this hasn't changed really ever since. State governments are still threatening to do that. Um, but ultimately, it was decided that the states would own and control the water from their own catchments. And therefore, the Commonwealth has, well, in that back then, really no power or very little power um, other than that that can be reached through agreement with the states. And that shifted a little bit with the Tasmanian Dams case, which, of course, found that the Commonwealth government had an external affairs power to sort of pull the states into line. Uh, when it had signed international environmental treaties. And it's that sort of scanty basis of power, plus a lot of negotiation, which allowed the Murray-Darling Basin Plan to be formed and adopted in 2012. Mm. And um, you do talk about, so, so the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was primarily a document for the environment, a policy to save the environment. Well, in theory, I mean, the, the basis of the Commonwealth's power is environmental, but the reality is that it's a political compact and it's an, and it's an environmental and an economic document. So technically and legally, it's an environmental document, but the reality is, I think, that it's it's got three 
aspects to it. Mm. And, but it was that kind of point that was pulled up in the South Australian Royal Commission that putting the social and economic factors on a level playing field with the environment may make it unlawful. Um, you did a really great job of kind of looking at all those, like the three different um, aspects there. Like how, how do you see those balancing in future and how do you see um, people coming together to, to actually have an, have an outcome for everybody? Well, at the moment I don't see them coming together. <laughs> it's, um, but I think, um, yes, as I say, technically and legally, um, it is an environmental document. That's what the Water Act, which uh, created the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, relies on. Um, and I think often people talk about these things as though they are opposed. You know, the environment and irrigation are opposed to each other. And, of course, there's one level at which that's right. If the irrigators take all the water, then you'll lose your remaining environmental assets. But it's also true that if the river dies, if it becomes infested with blue-green algae, if the fish all die, if the salinity um, infects the water, then the industry will suffer as well. Um, so they're not really opposed to each other. One of the things that I think people have trouble getting their head around is that unless we assume that we're all going to stop irrigating straight away and we're going to put back all the vegetation that has been cleared, we can't return the river system to its natural state. That is simply out of reach in real terms. And there's even disputes about what is natural. You know, if you talk to people along the river, they tend to assume that the natural state is what they remember as children or what their grandparents told them about. But in fact, um, the natural state of the river before we started putting in dams and rocks and weirs is well out of reach and, and out of living memory. And so what the um, environmental water holders model models tell her is the river's natural state is often quite foreign to the people who live along the river. It's one of the points of uh, dispute. Mm. And so what challenges are we facing in, um, like, do you, do you think it's important that people recognise that point? Um, yeah, I do, because I think we have to, you know, we can't base our decisions on the idea that we can take you know, dial back the clock and go back in time and take the river to, that, back to where it was. That is out of reach. Um, so we have to decide what the balance is between the irrigation industry and the agricultural industry and mining, which is also a factor in the basin, the needs of towns and populations, you know, cities like Adelaide, which rely for a fair bit of its drinking water on the Murray, and the environment. So we have to come to an agreement about the needs of that. And that is the idea behind the plan. Um, but the realities of it mean that irrigators are going to have to give up water. People are going to have to give up water. And, of course, that means um, disputes that are bitterly fought. Mm. And the challenge, one of the challenges is that you have to get agreement from all the states and the ACT, which is one of the basin governments, before you can do anything very much. And particularly in the case of New South Wales, I think it's fair to say New South Wales have been particularly difficult to deal with and currently are um, repeatedly threatening to pull out of the whole thing altogether. Not quite clear what that means, really. I mean, there isn't any other plan on the table, so I'm not quite sure what pulling out of the plan means, but they keep threatening to do it, which makes the politics very difficult. Mm. And um, so one of the, like a quote that I've pulled out of your book, um, is that we're kind of on these cycles of review, inquire and adjust to the policy, um, but no one's really brave enough to follow the risky business of questioning the fundamentals of the plan. Do you think that at some level that is necessary or do you think it's just the implementation that needs to be addressed? A bit of both. Um, certainly implementation needs to be addressed. Um, I think there are probably some problems with the way the whole thing was designed in the first place. But it is also true that if you had designed a perfect plan, you might never have got the agreements of the states in the first place. So in other words, you wouldn't have a plan. It's a very compromised document. Um, and it's easy to attack that. But the politicians would say, well, if we hadn't made those compromises, we wouldn't have it at all. You'd never have got the states to agree. 
And it's true that it was very, very difficult to get the states to sign on and to effectively give up some of their powers to the Commonwealth. And I think the fear, the reason why people won't go back and revisit the fundamentals is the fear that the whole thing will simply fall apart if they do, that the political tensions are so extreme um, that if they question the fundamentals, it will fall apart. So they sort of push on almost against the tide um, with the car falling apart around them. Mm. Mm. And uh, just a reminder to everybody watching uh, and welcome to everybody watching that this is a live and interactive session. So if you do have questions for Margaret, pop them in the comments. And there's one here from Anne. Margaret, did you find any irrigators talking about using less water um, in smarter ways to achieve similar levels of production rather than giving up water? Yes, they talk about that all the time. And indeed there are Commonwealth, mainly Commonwealth government schemes to uh, finance efficiency projects. But that is a very troubled area. So under the Labor government, the main way of clawing back this water for the environment was simply to go out into the marketplace and buy it. And most of that was done by open tender in a reasonably transparent way, not all of it, but most of it. Um, with the change of government to initially the Abbott government, um, that changed completely. And the main emphasis became um, efficiency schemes. Uh, which were carried out both at state and individual property level, and irrigators have been financed and subsidised to introduce more efficient means of irrigation. It's very troubled. On the first, you know, to start with, it's not transparent. It's very hard to find out who's been given money and for what and whether they're doing what they said they would do. We get lots of assurances, but it's very hard for journalists such as myself to check that out. Um, and it's not clear that they do actually save water. What is clear is that irrigators who have introduced efficiency measures um, will then expand the area under irrigation and go into the market for water and buy water. And so we're actually seeing new areas of irrigation opening up, which sounds seems counterintuitive, but it's partly because of the efficiency schemes together with water trading. And then there's also a very complicated issue. I don't know if people have got the brain space for this, it is complicated, called the return flows issue. I'll try and explain it simply. If you're watering, say, with an overhead sprinkler, um, a lot of the water will be wasted in the sense that it won't feed the plants, it will seep through into the aquifers and probably back to the river. If you then introduce drip irrigation, um, you can measure that very precisely. Probably no water will seep back into the aquifers and into the river. But there are some scientists who believe that the return flow has been reduced so much that in fact, the efficiency measures are meaning less water makes its way to the river than would without the efficiency measures, which sounds completely counterintuitive and I've probably done everybody's head in trying to explain that. But um, the worst estimates say that we might actually be going backwards because of more efficient irrigation, which sounds crazy, doesn't it? Mm, it is really a lot, a lot of uncertainty about it. We really don't know what the figures are in that. Mm, it really, to me, it really challenges the idea of saving water. That there is nothing wasted in the environment. So if it wasn't used by the crop, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a wasted drop. Well, exactly. But um, the, the the dominant dialogue, I think, in the basin is engineering, and has been ever since the beginning of irrigation, when. Um, Alfred Deakin, before he was Prime Minister, uh, basically introduced irrigation to Australia. And so a lot of the language around the river is, is really the language of irrigation, uh, of engineering, water engineering. And you have to work hard not to write it that way, I have to say. It'd be very easy to write a very bad book using all that language. <laughs> This is very technical. Yeah. Um, and so we've got another question coming through from Facebook this time from Paul. And Paul has a question to what extent the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is linked in any way with the Water Act mm. uh, and how the disconnection between land, the land ownership and the water titles and how that all plays in together. Yeah. Um, well, the Water Act 2007 uh, passed in the dying days of the Howard government and it was Malcolm Turnbull as Water Minister who was uh, largely responsible for that. Um, the Water Act established the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and which then began work on the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. So the Water Act 
is the legal instrument which brings the whole thing about. And what was the second part of the question? Sorry, it was um, around the separation between the land ownership and the oh, yes. titles. So that really predates the plan. Um, the idea of water trading, which was gradually introduced um, and starts back before that, but is certainly part of the whole picture now. Um, the idea was, I mean, it used to be that if you bought a piece of land, you would buy a water license with that land. But gradually, and again, it's complicated, um, the water licenses have been decoupled from the land. So you can now own a water license without owning the land um, and vice versa. The idea is that if you have a market for water, the market will tend to uh, mean that the water flows to its highest value use. So rather than using an awful lot of water to grow a crop that isn't very profitable, uh, there's an incentive there to use it efficiently and of course to use it for a, prop, a crop that is profitable. Um, the way that it, there's a lot of problems with the market, it's not a perfect market, not least because the river doesn't flow in a smooth and predictable fashion all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but also at the moment, uh, water is treated like any other commodity. Um, there are allegations that people are hoarding it um, and then selling in dry times at a higher price. It's tending to assist the dominance of cotton and almonds, which are probably the two most profitable crops in the basin at the moment. And that's assisted by genetic engineering, meaning that cotton can be grown further and further south. And the um, Australian Competition and Consumer Commission is currently looking at whether the market is fairly designed and operating properly. And... Um... So really, the, the the that point comes to the commodification of water, and hmm. you know, like putting a dollar value on something that is actually a living substance, or provide gives life to all other things at least. Water, water um, is a commodity like any other, and the water that is um, being clawed back for the environment is held as an allocation, in much the same terms that a cotton grower holds their allocation. So, no, it's definitely treated as a commodity. Mm. And um, there's quite a few more questions coming in, but I just wanted to check in with Mel. So Mel Gray is a community campaigner, a Healthy Rivers ambassador and a local based in Dubbo. Mel actually looks frozen on my screen. I should be back if you can let me start my video it won't let me start my video um okay just, here we go we've got two males now <laughs> um, i did freeze but i reinvented myself yes yeah. and so um you know listening to all of this What's, how does it relate to your experience? And do you want to um, have any input in some of the discussion that we've had so far? Yeah, it, it, um, we can see it playing out here in the Macquarie, of course. We're a, um, the Macquarie River is a major tributary of the Barwon and, and therefore the Darling, a really important river um, for, for Barwon and Darling because we have a winter-fed system. So the water that we push through the Macquarie marshes comes through in spring and late winter and it's just when the monsoonal fed rivers of the north are, are not feeding the darling so much. It's just one of the beautiful complexities of the basin. Um, we see um, the floodplain harvesting um, is uh, the great unknown and uh, not knowing those volumes of water. We had some beautiful tributary flows this year, this calendar year, and, and most of them entered the, the system below Burundong Dam, which is still only around 20% now, but we had some really nice flows in the Macquarie um, after an absolutely unprecedented shocking drought um, where we actually had the river cut off at Warren and, and the river below Warren was sacrificed, um, left to dry out and, and the need to rescue fish from the river. It was also a plan to rescue platypus from the river should the river be cut at Burundong, which was on the cards. Um, and, and with those first flows that came, um, the volumes of water that were uh, harvested with levees uh, directly onto crops, directly into paddocks, um, in, on, into on-farm storage is 
the great unknown volume. We can only estimate, we, we just have to wait until the volumes are announced. Um, and, but we, we know that that had a huge impact on the recovery of the North Marsh reed bed after a fire last year. That's the biggest reed bed in the Murray-Darling Basin, um, which had a, a huge fire. 5,000 hectares were, bur were burned every drop mattered and every drop mattered in summer as well so that the the reeds could have had a chance to grow and, and set some energy uh, for winter um, but we had um, significant volumes of water taken in summer uh, which which yeah we'll, we'll have to wait and see um, after the season what the impact would be but um, yeah, definitely the floodplain harvesting is um, an enormous issue for us here on the Macquarie, uh, trying to get con con connectivity through the Barwon. Um, yeah, it's a huge problem. Mm. Thanks, Mel. And we've got another question this time from Tyler. So um, do you think that the, uh, like what do you think are the implications for how we conceptualize the basin as a food bowl? And um, you yourself, you kind of start the book talking about um, it as our food bowl, which, which it certainly is. Um, how does our thinking around agriculture in the basin need to change? That one's from Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. Yes. Um, it's not only food, of course. It's also fibre because cotton is increasingly important. Um, but um, I think, as I indicated earlier, um, the way things are going at the moment, almonds and cotton are becoming increasingly dominant crops. Now, that can change. As I say in the essay, I remember when stone fruit was really important in South Australia, and it's much less so now because the market isn't there to the same degree. But I think there's a question here about whether we are happy to allow water markets to decide those things or whether we need policies which ensure that we continue to have a crop mix. And I think this question has been intensified to some extent by the COVID crisis and the shortages on our supermarket shelves. Um, most of those shortages were, of course, because of a big lift in demand that nobody saw coming. Uh, but I think it has intensified people's um, interest in food security. Of course, Australia is in a very fortunate position. We, we grow far more than we eat. And we can grow pretty much anything because of the diversity of climates within Australia. But of course, most things need water if you're going to grow them. So it does intersect with uh, food security, intersects with how we allocate water and whether we want policies which in some way try and ensure that there's a diversity of food. For example, do we care about whether there's a dairy industry in the basin? Do we care about whether we're self-sufficient in rice, which we were a few years ago, but are not at the moment, largely because of the drought? Um, and what do we do to ensure those things? Those are, are big political questions. And I say in the essay that at the moment, there is no side of politics which has really come up with the sort of rural and regional policies that might enable us to get to grips with those questions. So rather than trying to come up with an answer to your question, because it's probably above my pay grade as a humble journalist, I would just draw attention to the fact that we don't have policies. For example, the simplest way to get this water back to the environment would just be go in and buy it. Forget about all these so-called efficiency schemes and just go and buy it. Um, it has to do that is certainly a lot cheaper than the efficiency schemes. Everybody who's looked at it concludes that. Um, but the reason it's not done is because of the effect it has on rural communities, that um, they see their populations disappear, they see stranded assets with irrigation properties that are no longer connected to the system as a whole, those sorts of things. Again, if you had enlightened rural and regional policies to go along with that, you might spend some money in those communities on, say, education and health and other services, which would uh, in some ways compensate or make up for the fact that you're taking water away from those communities. But again, no side of politics is coming up with that sort of policy thinking. Really, um, politics has largely forgotten the basin. And for that reason, the remaining politics is going feral. Mm. And, you know, you looked into all those social and economic influences. Um, 
Is how how tight is the link between buying water back from communities and you know the range of social and economic um, hardships being felt in the basin, but also in farming communities outside the basin and outside Australia as well? Sure. Well, the Productivity Commission has looked at this and has concluded that while buying back water probably does have some impact on the problems of rural Australia, it's not the main thing. You know, rural towns are under strain for all sorts of reasons. Um, population is declining, and that's partly because there's fewer jobs due to mechanisation of agriculture and so on. Um, but the water buybacks tend to get blamed for the whole lot, really. Um, and that's probably not fair. But there certainly is an impact, and certainly I think rural Australia feels abandoned, and that's one of the reasons the politics have become so um, unmanageable. And uh, the National Party, which nearly always gets the agriculture and water portfolios in both state and federal governments, has really proved itself not up to the job. You know, they, they too have not, have not come up with the sorts of policies which might allow us to think this thing through holistically, which would include things like what do we want to do about the mix of crops grown in the basin? Of course, no farmer wants to be told what to grow, but there may be policies that you could pursue short of that, which would um, address some of these issues. Mm. And Mel, do you have any thoughts on these topics as well? Um, yeah, thanks, Meg. Um, we always talk about irrigation as if it's the only um, thing in the basin, and of course it's the dominant, um, especially in the southern basin, but particularly in the northern basin here, irrigation is really only gotten as big as it is, really expanded, you know, since the 80s and 90s. Um, and our communities were here a lot longer than that. We've got floodplain grazing communities along the Darling and along all of our rivers and all of our tributary rivers, which, um, you know, are healthy, sustainable industries. We've um, got recreational fishing is pulls in worth about a billion dollars a year economically to the basin. Um, you know, there's a lot more to to basin communities than irrigation. I know more so down on the southern basin in the Murray that that's um, it's there's been a lot more irrigation for a lot longer down there. But um, really, for us up here, our communities have been around a lot longer than these irrigation practices, and we have seen a big decline in the employment in a lot of our industries up here due to mechanisation and and the you know, the huge advances in um, genetic modification and and, and um, how, how the mechanisation of how they handle the product itself. They don't need anywhere near the number of people um, that they used to. So there's a lot of complexities um, around those economics, but particularly in the Northern Basin. Um, you know, the plan was, the, the Basin plan was, let's buy back water from voluntary set willing sellers through open tender processes and invest in regional communities and we know that for every dollar spent on human services like hospitals and schools and and infrastructure like that that creates four times as many jobs as um, irrigation infrastructure upgrades so the, what the what the where the plan's going now it's trying to deal with two policy areas with the one solution. It's trying to uh, throw um, infrastructure projects out there and say, well, that'll fix the jobs as well as return water to the environment. Well, we know that uh, most irrigators in the Southern Basin who had irrigation infrastructure subsidies actually increased their water take by 20, 28%. Um, so it's better to split that policy into two and buy back water for the environment. It's efficient. It's actually water. Um, it's, it's the most logical thing to do. And then invest money in human services in the basin to keep our communities alive. Mm. And it's kind of, I mean, this is going off topic a little bit, but the job keeper and the job seeker payments um, in response to COVID-19 have kind of shown, you know, the value of the people, the workforce in our city communities. Um, you know, like what, what would, 
what would boosting employment in regional areas and protecting regional jobs and like numbers of in terms of numbers of employment like what would that look like like if you say that um irrigation communities are becoming more and more mechanical and there's less jobs for um just less jobs available overall yeah well well the sorry was that a question for me or oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yes. um, <laughs> um Look, it's, it's complicated because, I mean, these are big trends. They're not only Australian trends, they're worldwide trends. The reality is that agriculture is becoming increasingly mechanised, not just irrigation agriculture, but, you know, broad acre farming as well um, is becoming increasingly mechanised. And it's going to be hard to wind that back. I'm not sure that anybody really wants to. Uh, but, of course, with that, you lose a lot of agricultural labouring jobs. And that means fewer kids in the school and fewer people buying from the shops. And, you know, those are big trends, which are not only about water, not even mostly about water, um, and they're international trends. So those are difficult questions. But, you know, you can see that if you had regional policies, you know, decentralisation policies, um, that you might well be able to reimagine what some of the inland might be like with particularly our large regional towns and so on. Um, so, you know, water at that point is not, an issue on its own it intersects with a whole idea of how we want to manage the the parts of our nation that aren't suburbs basically the other point i should have made earlier um the product Privacy commission also found that when water is bought back the decline in agricultural production isn't one for one so you know if you take back a liter of water it doesn't mean that you get you know the equivalent less agricultural production what that means is that farmers adapt so if they lose water from a piece of land, they will go into dry land farming and might grow wheat or something which isn't irrigated in that bit, or they will use the water that they've got more efficiently. So, you know, I think um, we often think that farmers can't adapt, but in fact, they, they have been and continue to be incredibly adaptable, uh, but they don't get much help from their governments um, in meeting those objectives. Rather, they get bribed and paid off. I think, which is a disrespectful way of treating them. Mm. I think it's so important um, that we remember that the Basin Plan came about for a very important reason. We, we were on the brink of losing uh, these ecosystems and we've certainly only gotten closer to that brink. And if we can't uh, provide these water, these rivers and wetlands, floodplains and aquifers with a basic amount of water so that they can exist, none of our communities can be out here. We had a situation over summer where 90 towns in New South Wales, not all of them in the basin, but a lot of them in the basin, were on the brink of evacuation. You know, we've got to remember the priority of the basin plan is, is enormous. It's to protect all this economy, all this culture and society that we have in the basin. Um, and and that, that gets lost in uh, perspective mm. a lot. Yes, I think people are often, you know, the campaign against the plan, and can the plan, they call it. Um, I'm not even really sure what it means. I mean, I, I, there's plenty wrong with plan and plenty with how it's wrong with how it's being implemented. But there is no other way. <laughs> you know, we do have to change this and make it work. Um, because without it, it will just be everybody for themselves. And, you know, people tend to blame the states, you know, upstream states blame downstream states and catchments blame other catchments and crops blame crops and there's a lot of demonising of crops that goes on. But the overall problem is really one of governance, I think. Uh, consistently right along the river system, all the individuals have gotten away with anything that governments would let them get away with. And some industries have been very dominant or have more lobbying power for whatever reasons of geography or history. Um, but people have basically done what they've been allowed to do or what they've been able to get away with. And the fact that they've been able to get away with things which are not optimal even now that we've got the plan um, is a fault of government and governance, I think. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Mm. Mm. So the buck stops with them, for sure. Um, we're getting pretty close to time. There are heaps of questions coming through. So um, I might just pick a handful, like one or two other questions before we finish up. But thank you so much for your thoughts so far. Um, just a reminder to everybody watching, 
that if uh, you're interested in reading Margaret's book and understanding really the background research to all of these comments, you can buy it at quarterlyessay.com.au and we'll pop the link in the comments. If you search search uh, Crimea River and Quarterly Essay will come up in your feed. Um, and also if you're joining, if you're enjoying this conversation, you can drop some change in our online tip jar. This conversation is brought to you by River Country and Friends of the Earth. And we're a grassroots organization doing it tough like everyone else right now. So if you are enjoying this and you have the means, we would really appreciate a few dollars in the online tip jar that will be posted in the comments. So um, just before we move on from buybacks, there was a question um, a, little, a little way back from Danushi. Uh, what are your thoughts on the role of the Commonwealth water holder in making buybacks as a um, one of the reasons for the driving for driving up prices in the water market? Yeah. Well, just a, a bit of a technical issue there. The Commonwealth Water Holder doesn't actually buy water. Um, that office manages the water once it's been bought. And the buying and selling is actually managed by the Department of Agriculture, I think. So the, the Commonwealth Water Holder only gets a look in after it's bought. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're going to buy the water back when water is scarce, obviously it may have an impact on prices. The extent to which it has or not is actually really hard to tell because most of the buybacks in the last few years have lacked transparency. And we've seen the sort of headline cases when, you know, farms that once were owned by um, Angus Taylor and so on are involved in selling water. But, you know, that's, that's not most of it. Uh, most of it happens and it doesn't make headlines, but it's very, very difficult to find out who's sold water, what is the water and how much have they been paid. And that's one of the problems right through the basin. Um, you know, as a, as a journalist, I'm used to thinking that I can find out who owns a piece of real estate if I have a reason for wanting to do it. I can find out who owns shares in a company, but I can't find out who owns water. And that's a big problem, I think. And it causes conspiracy theories. As I said <laughs> in the essay, there's a big conspiracy theory in the basin that Eddie Maguire and Penny Wong have bought <laughs> up all the water and are holding on to it. It's completely untrue but it's firmly believed by some people and you can't disprove it by referring them to a public record. Yeah, I did have a giggle when I read that one in the book. Like, mm. like Penny Wong, I can perhaps understand the connection to... Mm, but why Eddie McGuire? Don't ask me. Don't ask me. <laughs> um, and so there's another question coming through from Robert. Uh, how would we go with penalties such as loss of license for illegally pumping water, which was in the South Australian mm -hmm. Royal Commission, um, and any persons or company found doing this, like, you know, what do you think the penalties should be for? Um, well, there are penalties, of course, for water theft, and there are people before the courts right now, including some quite big irrigators from northern New South Wales and southern Queensland, um, and the penalties vary from state to state, but they're quite stiff. Um, the problem is that we haven't had enough people out there catching them at it. Um, and particularly in the Northern Basin, the metering is often not present at all. So it's basically an honesty system. Um, or if there are meters there, they're very old fashioned meters and fairly easily tampered with. Anybody who's sort of driven through Griffith or any of those areas will be used to seeing those pretty high tech meters with you know, solar panels and, and the whole works, they communicate data on water use back to the authorities in real time. Very different picture up in Queensland where you've got really old meters. Uh, they've got seals on them in theory, but everybody's got a box of seals in the back of the ute. Um, and certainly hanging around the pubs up there, I heard a lot of stories about water theft. So there are penalties. It is illegal. It is theft. And the penalties are quite stiff but we haven't had adequate enforcement. And there's now quite a lot of reports that have looked at that and have brought it up again, mainly the New South Wales government for simply ignoring breaches of the law. And that's got to change, I think, because the idea that your neighbor is stealing water or that if you don't use it, somebody else will just steal it, obviously undermines everything, undermines everybody's faith in the ability to plan to deliver fair results. 
I was just going to add, it's also a huge, a lack of metering is also a huge issue in groundwater uh, in the New South Wales Great Artesian Basin. There's no requirement for a meter. You just have to fill your log, log book in, um, which is outrageous, given um, the Ken Matthews report and the Water Resource Action Plan. Uh, mm. uh, but the rules are slow. Um, culture is slow to change. And you just need more people out there on the ground. I mean, I did an awful lot of driving. I wouldn't claim to have seen all the basin. I probably wouldn't even claim to have seen half of it. Um, you need a lot of enforcement on the ground and you need the culture in the relevant departments, which prioritises enforcement. And, you know, there is some suggestion of corruption around these things as well. The New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption has got an inquiry going right now. And I heard a lot of rumours about that when I was travelling. So there may also be corruption. But I think the majority of the problems will simply be a lack of will to um, to get the feet on the ground um, and the metering in place to make compliance policeable. Mm. And there is one comment here from Robert again, mm. like, what about jail? Is jail uh, an option for illegal behaviour? Um, it's certainly something that I've heard. If you drive through the Lower Darling, there are people who want to see people in jail. Yeah, um, look, I'm not absolutely sure about the maximum penalties, but I'm certainly under the impression that for gross water theft, um, jail is one possible penalty. I mean, it is a crime, just like stealing anything else is. Um, so I, I do think, and again, it varies from state to state, and I'm not 100% confident on this, but certainly I think jail is one possibility. Obviously, not for a little bit of fiddling here and there, probably, but for systematic, deliberate large-scale water theft, I think jail is an option, yes, already. The problem is policing it. The problem is getting serious about com about policing compliance. Mm. And we might actually just go to a final question now because it's just going on 7.30. Um, this one has come through from Jack and I saw a, a similar comment come through from Jonathan before. So how do the politics of climate change denial interact with the politics of the Murray-Darling? And I might just buddy that up with the other question I saw, which relates to the fact that climate change is reducing the inflows in the Murray-Darling by really substantial amounts. And we've seen recent reports saying that, you know, what, what is the impact of climate change and what is the impact of denial to that climate change in the basin? Well, the impact of climate change is already quite profound and, of course, likely to get more so. Um, and the most pessimistic predictions, basically, if they're true and nothing is done, they would see a huge amount of the agriculture in the basin wiped out um, before the end of the century. Um, so water, there was a report out on this from McKilty just recently. And again, I haven't got the fingers at my um, the figures at my fingertips, but um, that they showed a huge decline in the amount of rain over the basin, so the amount of water that's available for anybody to use or access. Um, climate change denial, um, I found only one out and out climate change denier in what a combined probably two months of driving around the basin talking to farmers. I don't think farmers by and large are climate change deniers. Of course, I'm generalising, there'd be some. Um, they don't want to think about it, and you can kind of understand that. I think we all feel some resistance to thinking about it because it's an awful prospect. Um, so you tend to get what I describe in the essay as a 10 million miles square stare when you raise it. But most of them acknowledge that um, it's real, um, that it's caused by humans, and that we probably need to do something about it. But what? It's very difficult for individual farmers and people to say in the absence of um, effective government policy, really. Um, the most optimistic thing you'll hear them say is a confidence that they will adapt as they have already adapted and that they can continue to adapt. Um, and I say in the essay, it would be nice to think that Australia as a whole and the politicians could actually meet them there and assist them to adapt rather than abandoning them. Need if I could... Um, yeah, what we, we are definitely facing a future with less water and there, there can be no doubt about that. We had a report published by the news, we had a draft report ready to be published but didn't get published.
by the New South Wales government in 2013 saying that Dubbo would have 30% less water available by 2030. Um, I think everybody would agree that that um, is actually too low an estimate, um, that we're facing an even more serious lack of water than that. And what the answer is in the strategic plans and the um, New South Wales government, um, you know, water plans and Water New South Wales 20 year plans is to, is to, re, is to put further regulation in the river to allow further extraction. And that's what we're facing here on the Macquarie. There's a plan to build a re-regulating weir uh, downstream between Warren and Narromine that will increase the available water determination each year, which will mean that all the irrigators in the whole valley can access a certain percentage more of their license than they would have otherwise. It'll reduce flows downstream into the internationally significant Ramsar listed Macquarie marshes. It'll make connection to the Barwon even more difficult. So they're doubling down. We've got a problem. We're going to have less water. So what do we do? Mechanise the river and extract more. So it's a very uh, serious, um, a very serious, not the way to address a drying future. Yeah, and so what, um, maybe just before we close out, what is the future, you know? What do you want to see? Like, can we give anyone some hope so, mm -hmm. you know, that there is, a, there is a future on the horizon and it is one we want to go to, like? Well, I, I came back from my trip feeling pretty gloomy, but not entirely devoid of hope. You know, the fact is that we do have a plan and while it is very imperfect, um, I think it was always invented that we'd have to change as we went ahead. And, you know, I think that we've got honest bureaucrats by and large at the federal level who are trying to do their best in an almost impossible political environment. Um, so I think, you know, it needs major change and major reform, and we need a government that's prepared to bite the bullet to do that. But also, I think a public education campaign, uh, both in the city and the country, because, you know, one of the things that I realised is that people even connected by the river system don't understand the big picture. One of the reasons I wrote the essay. So people in St George don't know what's going on in Renmark and the reverse is also true. Um, so I think we need a lot of work done on community building and on public education. And I have to say, watching the National Cabinet over recent weeks in this crisis, it's interesting there isn't a single member of the National Party in the National Cabinet. Um, and as I indicated earlier, I think the National Party, for various reasons, have proved to be not up to the job of managing the Murray-Darling Basin. I mean, try and take the water portfolios off them, it would be pretty difficult to do. But um, the National Cabinet, obviously not without conflict and disagreement, has managed to achieve a response to an immediate crisis. If the National Cabinet keeps going past this immediate crisis, then I would have thought one of the things it could turn its attention to would be the Murray-Darling Basin. We have the Council of Australian Governments, but um, that, of course, gets endlessly bogged down and just seems to increase the divisions. It's nice to think that a, a, the National Cabinet could actually bring some resolution to these issues and at least stop this infantile business of constantly threatening to pull out of the plan. I mean, it's a meaningless thing to say, really, but it makes the politics very difficult. Thank you. Mel, do you have any final words? Um, yeah, I, I guess hope for the future. I have um, hope in us, in the grassroots communities of the basin. Uh, we know what's at stake. You know, we know um, our patch. We know um, the, what the, our local issues are. Um, and I have faith when I see how many people are watching online and how, when I see how many people engage in um, local actions and, and local um, against uh, wanting to learn about local issues um, and how it does connect to the whole basin. Um, that's where I have to put my faith because like Margaret, I don't think the National Party are up to the task and try as we might, we can't budge them off these natural, uh, natural resource por um, uh, portfolios. So um, yeah, we are our own, we are the hope. 
We are the hope. Well, that if that's not the moment to finish on, I don't know what is. So uh, I would like to thank you both very, very much for taking the time um, to instill your wisdom upon all of us online. I think we have had about 200 people tuning in over, over the past hour. And so I would like to thank every single one of you that's watching as well. Um, and if you could join me in the comments in thanking Margaret Simons, the author of Crimea River, and Mel Gray uh, from Healthy Rivers Dubbo. Um, yeah, send us, send us some love in the comments. And also remember that sharing is caring. So this is live on Facebook right now, but it is a conversation that need, we need to get out as far and wide as we can. So please hit that share button, encourage your friends to watch it. It's um, a really important discussion and one that I hope to continue in a forum like this. So yeah, keep your eyes out uh, for more conversations in future. It's pretty clear that the restrictions on how we can gather and how we can see our friends are, you know, going to be with us for a little while longer. So we're going to try and stay connected while we keep our distance with conversations like these. So um, yeah, please keep your eye out, follow the River Country campaign. Um, and We've also, we'll also be posting in the comments right now our petition to finish the buybacks under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. So there's still money and there's still 50 billion litres of water that can be bought back for the Murray-Darling under the existing plan. Uh, so sign the petition. Um, also check out Margaret's book at the quarterly essay, Crimea River, The Tragedy of the Murray-Darling Basin. And uh, yeah, again, if you have enjoyed this discussion, consider dropping a few dollars in our online tip jar um, to help us keep this work up in future. So thanks everyone for joining us. I am just gonna finish with a little video that um, has been put together with a whole bunch of our friends around the basin. Um, so just bear with me one tick while I get that up for us. It's right here and devastation. Our rivers are dying, but there is hope. We can revive our rivers. And we all know the key is to have more water flow down our rivers, over our floodplains, and into our wetlands. We need to buy back more water from irrigation use and make sure that water actually flows down our rivers. Buy back more water. Buy back more water. Buy back more water. Too much water is sucked out of our rivers or diverted into private dams before it even gets into a river. Scientific studies found we needed this much water for our rivers to be healthy. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan set a target to recover this much water. So far, we've only recovered this much water. Clearly, we are taking too much water from our rivers. There are simply too many straws in the glass. The most effective and cheapest way to revive our rivers is to buy back water licenses from willing sellers. Water that is bought back from irrigation is then used for everyone's benefit. It flows down our rivers, reviving the environment, the birds, the fish, the animals, and the community spirit as it slowly winds its way downstream, giving life to our beautiful and unique country. It is water for nature. Buy back more water. Buy back more water. Buy back more water. Buying back more water flushes out salt, algae, and nutrients, keeping our rivers healthy. We should be able to swim in and drink water from our rivers, not have our mighty fish suffocating in stagnant pools. Buy back more water. Buy back more water. Buy back more water. Voluntary water buybacks are the best way to meet the targets in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Water is the lifeblood of our dry continent support buying back more water. Buy back more water. Buy back more water. Buy back more water. More water has to be returned to the river. Come on, Australia. Let's revive our rivers.